Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture series. My name is Rachel, I'm a new intern at the Science Squad, and today we have Dr. Tenlin here. She will be teaching us about the germ cells of water bear embryo. Hope you guys enjoy. Well, thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about tardigrades and my research. Hey guys, so this is Rachel again. We actually lost the beginning part of the audio of this lecture, so I'm just going to fill you in a bit. Dr. Tenlin is talking about mitosis, the division of cells, and how cells will multiply rapidly. At the end of that process, the animal is fully formed and has hundreds or thousands or millions of cells that each has their own identity and has their own and one of the questions I'm interested in answering is, how do all those cells know what they're supposed to do in the right location and at the right time? So your skin cells have a certain function, your blood cells have a certain function, your muscle cells have a certain function. So what causes those cells to be formed properly and to function properly? And one of the cell types that I'm particularly interested in are called germ cells. And germ cells are the cells that give rise to the next generation. And you can think of germ cells as stem cells. So they are able to make any other type of cell. And when a human is developing or a worm or a tardigrade, there are special cells set aside during development that will make only germ cells. And that's illustrated here. So if we start with, for example, a one-cell embryo, that one cell embryo will divide, and eventually it will produce certain cells that become muscle or skin cells, etc. And we call those differentiated cells. But it will also produce cells that will become the germ cells. And these are not differentiated. They don't have a set identity like a blood cell or a muscle cell. Instead, they have this unlimited potential to make any type of cell. And if you're a male, the germ cells are going to make your sperm. And if you're a female, the germ cells are going to make your egg. And that will then allow those two types of cells to come together to form a brand new individual. And we know a lot about germ cells from studying their roles in organisms such as fruit flies, nematodes, etc. But we still have a lot of unanswered questions. For example, how do germ cells evolve? How did different animals adopt different mechanisms to make germ cells? And to get a good question, we needed to identify an organism that shared some relationship with some of the more well-studied systems, but might provide us more information on how these processes work. So we know, like you said, a lot about fruit fly development and roundworm development and mouse development in terms of how germ cells are formed in those specific animals. But we can't really say a lot about how germ cells might have arisen or evolved from a common ancestor. And so what I'm showing here is just one snippet of the animal family tree or the tree of life. And the branches highlighted in yellow here are all closely related animals. They belong to a single cluster of animals. And they all share a single common ancestor back here. And one of the cool organisms in this cluster are tardigrades. So tardigrades are closely related to both arthropods and nematodes and have the same common ancestor as those organisms. But based on some very limited evidence that we have, it suggests that um, the tardigrades might be making germ cells in an entirely different way. So that was one reason why I really got interested in studying tardigrades or water bears, because they provide a model system that does things slightly differently and can be used to compare to what we understand about germ cells in fruit flies and nematodes. So what are tardigrades? So this is the species I work with. It's called Hitsibius exemplaris. Tardigrades are segmented, so we have a head and there are four pairs of legs segments. And what's really cool about tardigrades in general is that at the end of every leg, there are these unique claw structures. 
And they used the claws to hold on to algae, moss, uh, filaments, etc. And that's how they move around in their environment. But every single species of tardigrade has a unique claw structure, and we can actually use those claws to help distinguish one species from another. So that's kind of a cool um, feature that they have, is this ability to make unique claws. Um, they also have eye spots. Um, we know that the eye spots are able to detect the difference between light and dark. We don't know if they can tell the difference between colors. So, and we know for sure that they cannot sense shape, but we can definitely say that they can see light versus dark. So they're very simple. They're microscopic. They live, they're no longer more than maybe a millimeter in size. They live primarily in moist habitat, whether a pond or on moss or lichen that's covered with a layer of water. And in this video that was taken by my research mentor who introduced me to tardigrades and 12 years ago. This is a Hinsidious exemplar. We have it mounted on a microscope slide in water. And this is, just, we just use regular spring water you can buy at the grocery store. And they eat algae. So all these green specks you see in here, the green algae that was added to the water as their food source. Now you can tell that they're having a little bit of trouble walking around. And that's because their legs and claws are not adapted to crawling around on glass, on like on a microscope slide. So they get kind of clumsy. And in fact, the name tardigrada means slow walker. And that was because of the fact that they had such a hard time walking on glass slides. Now, tardigrades are best known for their ability to withstand really extreme environments. Um, they can withstand being dried out or desiccated. They can withstand really cold temperatures, really hot temperatures. And they've also been sent out into space several times now. And they can survive being exposed to vacuum of outer space and to solar radiation from the sun. And so they've kind of captured people's fancy for their ability to just survive anything. And one of my favorite cartoonists, Beatrice the Biologist, kind of illustrates that in this cartoon, Water Bear Doesn't Care. But beyond just these cartoons, tardigrades have kind of entered popular culture. And if you saw the movie Ant-Man and the Wasp that came out last year, there's a scene where Michael Douglas's character is traveling to the quantum realm, and he encounters this menagerie of tardigrades. And these tardigrades appear kind of larger than life because obviously he has shrunk them down to a small size. But it's really kind of cool if you go to YouTube and look for the director's cut about how they made this scene. The animation of those tardigrades is actually pretty incredible. But they look kind of alien. They're this, they, even though we can find them anywhere in our environment, um, they have the kind of alien appearance to them. You can actually find them out in your own backyard. If you find a patch of moss or lichen, you can scrape it up, put it in a glass dish, and then cover it with just a small amount of spring water that you get at the grocery store. Don't use tap water to get the chlorine in it. And after a couple of hours, you'll, you should be able to start seeing tardigrade crawling around in there under a microscope. So maybe you can find them anywhere. So one of the reasons why we study this particular species of Hypsidius exemplar is, first of all, there is, that you can grow them in the laboratory. And it's kind of ironic when you think about the fact that tardigrades can survive any environment. It turns out only a few species can live in a lab environment, and we have no idea why that is. It turns out Hypsidius exemplaris is one of those species that can live in the lab. The other reason why we study this particular species is because the body is what we call optically clear. You can actually see right through it when they're on a microscope. So I'm going to play a video I took. This is a female. She is laying her egg, so she has two embryos here, and she is molting. So she's actually getting rid of her old skin and growing a new skin. So right now, as I start to play this video, She's trying to crawl out of her old skin and she's going to leave her two embryos behind and she's going to walk away. Just a note, all of these little balls you see here are just glass beads that I put on the microscope slide so that when you cover it with a cover skin, it doesn't squash the tardigrade. But you can kind of see 
up here that she can kind of poke a hole through the rest of her old skin so that she can crawl out of it. Um, this took four hours in real time. And this video kind of speeds it up a little bit. I mean, that's what she, she's putting a lot of effort into trying to crawl out of that exuvium, out of her old skin. And now here she's able to do it. So what you'll notice in addition to the fact that she's moving around now and she'll crawl away eventually is that we can actually see how many cells these embryos have. So both of these embryos have two cells. And now pretty soon, if we waited long enough, they would divide into four cells, etc. So I have another video that I made of two embryos that are undergoing mitosis. They're undergoing cell division. So they were just starting division at the one cell stage. Now they're going to divide into the two cell stage. So here we can see the two cells there and in this embryo. And then those two cells will divide into four cells. And you can see that happening right here. And then pretty soon it will happen in this embryo. So if I speed this movie up a little bit, after six hours, we have two embryos that each have over 40 cells in them. And by this point, we can already start to see pattern of cell movement and cell behavior that will allow us to start identifying specific tissues, such as the formation of the intestine, the formation of muscles, etc. One of the questions that I don't know the answer to yet is where are the germ cells? So we know the germ cells will be somewhere in the middle of the embryo. And we have some ideas about what specific cells make the, will become the germ cell, but we haven't identified them yet. And that's something that my lab is really interested in um, uncovering the, the answer to. And that's going to take some time before we have a definitive answer. But one of the things that we need to do in order to definitively identify the germ cells is to have a way to look for them, to have markers for germ cell identity. And we just sequenced the tardigrade genome just within the last three, four years. Um, so we know the entire DNA sequence of all the genetic material in tardigrade. However, we don't know yet what that DNA encodes. So we don't know the organization of the genes in the genome, nor do we know what those genes do in tardigrade. So as a starting point to try to um, figure out what genes are required for germ cell formation and to start to understand how those genes are organized in the tardigrade genome, we started to, by compiling a list of germ line proteins that we know in other animals are required to make germ cells. And now we're asking, do those same proteins exist in tardigrades? And if so, do they actually play any kind of role in making tardigrade germ cells? So one of the genes that I focus on is called MAGO. And MAGO is a really highly conserved gene. And by what, what I mean by that is almost every animal has a protein called MAGO. And if you compare the protein from flies, human, worms, etc., they are all really, really, really similar to one another. So they're very highly conserved. And we can identify specific roles that Mago plays in other animals. So, for example, in fruit flies, Mago is required to make germ cells. So we have evidence that if you knock out Mago, fruit flies cannot make germ cells anymore. But Mago is also required for segmentation, for making the abdominal segments in fruit flies. So when you get rid of Mago, fruit flies don't make a normal abdomen. In nematodes, they don't have segments, so we wouldn't expect MAGO to be required for segmentation in nematodes. But in nematodes, it is required to elongate the embryo along a head-tail axis. So the worm starts to grow longer and longer and longer, and that process seems to require MAGO. So since flies and nematodes are closely related to tardigrades, I can start to make prediction what I would expect to observe in a tardigrade embryo if I were to somehow knock out Mago. So the first thing I had to do was to find 
model in the tardigrade genome. So I use the fly version of the model protein. I'm not shown on the top query line. So this line, this line, and this line all indicate the model protein in fruit flies. And then I put it into a database that's operated by the National Center for Biotechnology Information. And this database is freely available. It's paid for by taxpayer dollars. And it has sequences from all sorts of organisms, including the tardigrade genome. So I asked it to search all of the tardigrade sequences to see if it could find a protein sequence that was similar to this fruit fly mago. And what I'm showing on the screen here is the result that came out of this search. The lower line here corresponds to the tardigrade version of mago. And what's cool is that mago and tardigrade and fruit fly are really, really similar to one another. Almost 80% of their amino acids are identical. And so that gives me a lot of confidence that I have identified the correct mago protein. And so the other thing I can learn from this is what the actual DNA sequence looks like. So I can click on this link here, and that will take me right to the tardigrade gene sequence for MAGO. So now I know what the DNA looks like, and I know what the messenger RNA looks like based on this sequence. And I can use that information to try to pull this gene out of tardigrade. And we do that using a mechanism called the polymerase chain reaction. And if you think of PCR as a big copy machine, so you have a test tube where you add your tardigrade DNA and you add reagents that allow you to identify the specific model gene and make lots and lots and lots of copies. So by the time this reaction is done, you actually can have over a million copies of MAGO in this really small test tube. And then to see if the MAGO was actually made, you can use a technique called gel electrophoresis. And in gel electrophoresis, you use a material called agarose that's taken from seaweed, and it has a jello-like consistency, so it's a little bit wobbly, but it's a little bit solid as well. And the DNA will run right through the material of the agarose, and you apply an electrical current and since DNA has a negative charge to it, we apply it so that it's going to run towards a positive pole. And by that process of separation via electrophoresis or using electricity, you can actually separate the product based on their size. And so in this gel, I have different lanes where I loaded different samples. In the first and the last lane, I loaded a ladder. And a ladder is just is simply a collection of bands of DNA where I know the exact size of that band. And then in all of these other lanes, I loaded um, individual PCR reactions from taken from different animals. So this is from one animal's genome, this is another animal's genome, etc. And the gene was predicted to be about 500 nucleotides, 500 base pairs of DNA. And this band in the ladder is also 500 base pairs. So it looks like in all of these lanes, I have a product that appears to be MAGO. In some of these lanes, the band is super faint, but there is a band there. And in these last two lanes, the um, PCR didn't work for some reason. But this is a cool result, because not only do I know what the MAGO sequence is, but now I know that I can pull it out of the animal, that it is actually made into a product such as messenger RNA. So the next thing I wanted to do is ask, what would happen if I knock it out? How does MAGO affect tardigrade development? So to do this, I used a technique that was developed by other researchers way back in the 1990s. And this technique is called RNA interference. And what we do is you take double-stranded RNA. So this is this RNA is specific to the gene you want to knock out. So in my case, this is double-stranded RNA that recognizes MAGO. So it has one strand that's identical to MAGO, and then it has the other strand that's like the opposite, the complementary strand to MAGO. And when you ingest it into the cell, it gets chopped up into smaller pieces. And then it, the small pieces get separated so that one strand can then go to the, and find the actual MAGO messenger RNA.
RNA sequences that are inside the cell. And when this fragment binds to messenger RNA, that messenger RNA is then cut up and destroyed. And since there's no more messenger RNA, that messenger RNA cannot be translated into protein. So this is a way to prevent the animal from being able to make any mongo protein. And so then if there's no mongo protein, I can ask, what effect does that have on the animal? What effect does that have on embryo development? So what I did is I took double-stranded RNA with a, that was made specifically for MAGO, and I injected them into the tardigrade. This is the microscope I used for this. This is a regular compound microscope. You may have seen something similar in your lab, in high school, whatever. Um, you have your oculars, there's your objective lenses up here, etc. The one thing that makes this different from other microscopes is we have this long needle holder right here. <clears throat> and there's an air line that feeds into this needle holder. So you basically push air into the needle holder and you force the air to kind of build and build and build to a high pressure. And at the other end, I have a capillary needle that has a lot of double-stranded RNA in it. And you can actually tap on the foot pedal, and that releases all of the air that's building up. And it forces, excuse me, it forces the double-stranded RNA into the tardigrade. And so that's what I have here. I just took a picture of one of my tardigrades. The needle is sticking into the body. And when you push on the foot pedal, all of that double-stranded RNA is inserted into the animal's body. And what's really remarkable is they tolerate this really well. You would think having a needle stuck in you would not be a pleasant experience. But for tardigrades, they kind of perk up after about a half hour or so, and they'll crawl around and they'll walk around in their cold tissues. They'll start laying eggs after a couple of days. <clears throat> and they seem to you know, survive having a needle stuck in them without much issue. So, it's kind of remarkable that they're very flexible in terms of these types of experimental manipulation, but we can learn a lot of information doing this type of attention. So what I then did is I collected all of the embryos from the animals that had been injected with this mixture of double-stranded RNA specific to Bongo, and I asked, well, what effect does that have? So I'm going to show you first what would happen in a normal embryo. So this is the way normal embryos develop. Now, tardigrade embryos take a long time to develop compared to other simple organisms like worms or flies. So it takes four days from fertilization to hatching, which is a long time to wait when you're trying to do experiments. But after about a day and a half, you can actually start to see elongation. So the tardigrade embryo is growing along the head to tail axis. So this A represents anterior. So this is the head end of the animal and it wraps around to the tail end, which is marked by P, which stands for posterior. And you can actually see the outline of the egg shell. So the egg shell is kind of this solid structure, and the tardigrade is just wrapping itself around inside the egg shell. And then by four days, the tardigrade is completely wrapped around on itself. And you can actually see here's the mouth. We have the pharynx. So food is going to enter through here. It's going to be crushed up in the pharynx. And then it will be passed into the intestine. And the intestine is wrapping all the way around. And there's more to the intestine underneath the mouth part that you don't see. So this embryo is completely elongated and it's getting ready to hatch. So then what happens if you get rid of MAGO? So this is an example of an embryo that has no MAGO protein. And this embryo is five days old. So this is five days after fertilization. So this embryo is even older than this normal embryo I showed up here. And what's interesting is that there are these markers that we see, these really bright spots that tell us there's an intestine forming right here. So it's trying to make an intestine. And I know that it's also trying to make other types of cells such as muscle. But it is not elongated. It is still a very short embryo. There's no obvious head, no obvious tail. It's not wrapping around on itself. So this is kind of a cool result because this is also what we saw in nematodes. So this suggests that 
in the common ancestor of tardigrades and nematodes, MAGO was doing something similar. It was probably affecting the elongation of the animal um, a lot, which would normally allow the animal to grow and get longer, etc. But when you knock it out, these embryos are no longer able to do that. So one thing I don't know yet is whether or not MAGO also affects the germ cells in tardigrades. One of the problems with this phenotype is that the embryos can't hatch, and if they can't hatch, they can't grow up into adults and reproduce. So it's possible that because I'm screwing up something so early in development, I wouldn't necessarily be able to see an effect on the germ cells because that's something that forms later in development. So I'm trying to figure out how do I manipulate MAGO so I can get the embryo to make it far enough along the hat, but then get rid of MAGO so it can't make germ cells. So that's a problem that my undergraduate students and I are still working on. But this is just one example of how we study genes in tardigrade. And in the big picture, if I think about five, ten years from now, what I hope to be able to say is that we know the identity of specific proteins that make germ cells, and we can use those proteins to actually identify the germ cells in the tardigrade, and then start to make comparison to what we understand about germ cells in other organisms to better understand how these mechanisms evolved over time. Because, it, I mean, we think about the fact that the entire animal of the next generation comes from these very specific cells of the previous generation. It's really cool to think about how that process might occur. So thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about tardigrades.